get started. So as you know, uh, just a midterm review day here. So I'll just get through a couple of quick uh, reminders and then happy to take questions. I've got a couple of prompts in some marketing questions to see if you can generate that. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the big thing here is that, uh, as a reminder, there is a review assignment that you can continue to take throughout today and tomorrow. You can take as many times as you want. Every time you take it, it should draw random questions from all the five past units. Uh, it will take your highest score. So uh, there's no harm in taking it again. So if you take it again and bomb it because, uh, you know, you just want to skip a couple of questions, that's totally fine because it will take your highest score. Um, and it is out of 45 unit comprehension points. So if you do well on it, it'll buffer some of your unit comprehension scores from the, the past. Um, and it will be very similar to the types of questions that I will put on the midterm. Um, the uh, midterm, two-stage exam. So stage one, the individual stage, uh, will open Thursday. So I'm going to make it available uh, all of Thursday, all of Friday, and all of Saturday. So it is a 90-minute uh, exam, all on Canvas in Respondus Lockdown Browser. If you would like to come here Thursday during class, I will be here, and you can bring a laptop and you can take it in class. Otherwise, you can start it anytime Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Once you start it, you'll get 90 minutes to complete it. And of course, it has to be completed by 11.59 Saturday night. Um, if you come to class, because there's a class that comes here right after this, I have to limit you to the, you know, the 75 minutes. Um, but uh, and also, if you come to class, you can just start it immediately um, and uh, take as much time as we can get um, you know, up to when the next class starts. But again, there's no requirement to come to class. Um, that is an individual exam. It's closed book, closed notes. But you can have two pages of double-sided formula sheets where you can put anything on there as long as it's hand-produced. So I don't want uh, you to, be, uh, to put any photocopies of anything, any copy and paste of anything. But if you want to type it yourself, that's fine. If you want to draw graphs yourself in some digital program, that's fine. I just don't want you to just do uh, a copy and a paste or a photocopy. Um, I also allow you to have two pages of scratch paper, just totally blank paper. So during the respondents process, you'll show all four sheets to the camera um, and, um, and then that'll be that. Um, I encourage you to use your scratch paper to um, note any problems that you found particularly difficult that you wanna review on so that you can come back to them during stage two and hopefully score better on those. So then uh, that will be, again, um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then um, Sunday, the muddiest point will open up. So it normally opens up Thursday. Um, and that will give you an opportunity to reflect on what do you think were the hardest problem of stage one, uh, the sort of the most interesting or relevant uh, problem of stage one. And then you feel free to then respond to other people's comments. And maybe you can then start helping each other say, oh yeah, I did think that problem was tricky, but here's my thoughts about it. So that kind of starts the kind of group process. And I will leave that muddiest point open uh, through Wednesday at 11.59. So it's a little different muddiest point there. And then stage two, the group-based one, will be open all of Monday, all of Tuesday, and all of Wednesday until 11.59. And again, on Tuesday at the class time, you can feel free to come to this period, and, uh, and I will be here, and you can work together. Uh, you know, it, you know, full voice, you know, just like, you know, there's, it's, it, so you can be talking to each other, you can form subgroups or whatever, or you can decide to do it uh, in any other time. That stage two will be on Canvas. It will not be a timed exam. Um, all of the content-based questions will be identical. So there might be some rule-based questions like, you know, on the, on stage one, I might have a question or two that like, make sure you did the respond to stuff. And on stage two, I might have a question or two about making sure you understand stage two, but all of the content-based stuff from units A through E will be the same across the two uh, exams, stage one and stage two. Um, you won't know your scores. Uh, you won't know the right answers between the two of them. Uh, but again, you can work together. You don't have to come to class. You can work uh, outside. Uh, because it's not timed, you can open it and come back to it. Uh, later, you just need to make sure you submit it by 11.59 on Wednesday. It's open book, open notes, open canvas, and open classmates in this class. 
Uh, so not anybody else, not any other websites, but any resource that I've provided you, the textbooks and so on, those are fair game. Your own notes, anything on Canvas, it's fair game. All right, and I think, um, you know, again, you can come to class, but not required. Um, so that's basically an outline of how things are going to run. Any questions? Say about the, the layout of this before we get into content. Yeah. Stage two is it on the response list, right? It's not on response list, but it's really on campus. So it'll be a campus based exam, but you just enter it into a normal web browser. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so when you have you were talking about how we could go on some app or something to make a um, notes page, could we also just have some pages of notes on paper? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the traditional, the traditional way to do that. I say that a lot of students don't like to handwrite their formula sheets. And so I'm okay with you typing them if you're more comfortable with that. But I just don't want you, um, I want them, you to actually be the one to type them out, not just like, you know, take a passage out of uh, Melody Mitchell's book and paste it in or something like that. And also, um, will we need to know all the archetypes? Like, is that a pretty, because in the, in the practice exam, a lot of questions were on that. So would it be better to? I would say these these archetypes are the ones that you should you should definitely be able to differentiate among these archetypes. And you know, if you want to draw versions of these archetypes on your formula sheets, that's totally fine. Yeah. For the actual formula exam, is it similar to the midterm review? Um, yeah. So I would say it's similar to the midterm review. Basically, what I do when I build the midterm exam, and I'll go through these, is at the top in Canvas, if you go to every unit's module, the very top, it says like unit A study guide, unit B study guide. And so like for unit A, it looks like this. And so when you go into that study guide, it has a list of learning outcomes, which are what you should know after this unit. So <clears throat> what I do is I just look at this for every unit and I think, <clears throat> well, I have a certain target for roughly how many questions I want per unit. So I look through this and I say, well, um, I probably should ask a question about negative feedback. And I go through the same process that I do when basically I do the unit comprehension assignment. So um, now that we've seen all five units, I might try to synthesize a little bit because there might be things that happen in unit five, which um, I could, you know, relate to unit A, but, but roughly um, for unit E versus unit A. But, but generally, it's going to be very similar to the midterm review, where I'm going to try to put questions that are most A-like at the top, most E-like at the bottom, and, um, and they're going to sort of be drawn off of this learning outcomes. And they will be multiple choice, because it's Canvas-based, or they won't necessarily be multiple choice, but they will be the same types of problems, the fill in the blank, the dragging the words around, the matching that you've seen um, in all the previous Canvas activities. Yeah. Will the exam reuse questions from the midterm review? Or um, not intentionally. Um, I can't guarantee that um, I don't accidentally give the same question or whatever, but it is not my intent to draw from those previous questions. But, um, you know, if a previous question asks you the difference between resilience and adaptability, you probably would imagine another question very similar to that. But maybe instead of being a multiple choice, it might be a fill in the blank. They're all written specifically for the, the midterm, uh, for the yes. exam. Yes, uh, they'll be, um, it's a unique set of questions I come up with. Um, I, I will tell you the truth that I do look at all of the old banks and I use that to kind of inspire questions. Um, so you might see a similar flavor, but I'm not going to pull any questions directly off the old banks. I mean, I guess I might if I really, really like the question, but it's unlikely because during the stage two, you'd have access to all of those. That'd be kind of like, you know, cheating, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, are the questions going to be like counted for partial credit, like they are on like the midterm review, or is it going to be like you get one part wrong and it's all incorrect? It's to whatever limits that Canvas allows. And so there are certain Canvas question types that permit partial credit. And when they do, I generally check that box and say yes, and you can do that. There are unfortunately some canvas question types that if I was grading manually, I probably could find a way to include partial credit, but in structure who builds canvas just doesn't do it that way. So, and, and sometimes it doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason. Like I think 
multiple choice questions and multiple answer questions in Canvas are partial credit, but like maybe multiple fill in the blank are, I forget all the, the different things are. So I will do, I, it is my intent to provide as much partial credit as possible. On the other hand, um, I do want to sort of say that like, um, I'm a big fan of every question being worth the same amount. Like this isn't like a, a I'm not going to have some questions where like, this is really important. This is 10 points. And this is not quite important. It's one. Um, Cause to me, um, the really important, like a lot of times, the things that are multiple points are things that have multiple steps. Like we don't do calculation in this class, but that'd be kind of an example. And to me, like if you're going for a job interview in a place that you know studies that where you're like looking to be the sustainability officer or whatever, a lot of times the concept-based questions are just as important as the quantitative questions. And we often give more points to quantitative questions, but a lot of times you're not going to be asked to do a quantitative problem. So um, in general, um, if you see a question on the test that's five points, it's probably because it has five parts to it. It's not because it's like, you know, five times more important than all the rest. Yeah. So what were you saying about the study guides with the lettering? Yeah. Um, so if you go to the, like, if you go to the unit A module on Canvas, the very first link at the top of the module is unit A study guide. And, um, and if you click on that at the top of it, well, it says like a description unit, um, it will give the learning outcomes, which are for every unit, what I think you should know coming out of the unit. And so when I create questions for the midterm, I have all of these sitting in front of me and I can, I'll go through this. There's no content questions. I'll just go through and point out these things. And I'll say like, right, so I want to build three questions from you today. So I pick kind of three things in here I want to hit, and I build a question on that. Then I move to unit B. I want to build three questions from unit B, so I hit three things out of this. So all of these study guides are available for you um, in each one of those units. So I definitely recommend, if you're trying to figure out how to prioritize, um, you know, rather than looking back at all the lectures and like watching all the lectures again, which would be crazy, instead, um, go to the study guides and say, how well can I, am I familiar with all these things? Do I understand this? And if you don't, then um, if you go to the individual lectures, you can see like, okay, which lecture do we define bounded rationality? And then you can maybe look for that specific stuff. Any other general questions before we get into specifics about the content? I hope everybody's seen that those study guides are available, that that, Review assignments available. All right. Um, I guess other things I sort of, it says on the syllabus, um, anything that I've asked you to read or that we've discussed in class, I view as kind of fair game. But again, I would prioritize the things on those study guides. Because with that, are there any specific questions? Things you'd like me to go over? Um, yeah, there aren't. I'll just sort of like point out things from every unit and then we'll pause and then see if we exercise, I guess, any uh, any questions out of the unit. Yeah. Can you give us the um, types of system archetypes? Yeah. Yeah, the system archetype type. So, um, so that comes from unit B, systems archetypes, and these are like the basic uh, systems archetypes that you would use in conversation about systems. There are more, but these are sort of the basics. Um, I put a little quick reference um, here. So this is available on Canvas uh, uh, as well. And this is, comes directly from him and Landon. Um, I, uh, and I'll, I'll go back to this here in a second. Um, I also think the archetypes family tree uh, which is from Goodman and Kleiner, another article you read, is a good one to look at. The reason I like to bring up the archetypes family tree is it shows that many of these archetypes are just embellishments of other archetypes. So if you, you know, if you start out and you, you know, you know a growth loop and you know a balancing loop, those are kind of qualitatively different. But then you can kind of embellish um, a, uh, a growth loop in different ways, and that uh, generates the other archetypes. And you can embellish a balancing loop in other ways, and that generates 
the other archetypes. And so, um, you know, if you become comfortable with this diagram, then I think you'll start seeing the relationships. So, um, so this is one quick reference, all on kind of one page. If you go to Kim and Lannon and scroll to the bottom of it, it has kind of a breakout, uh, even more, um, you know, descriptions here. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I necessarily should go through all of it, but are there particular archetypes that are hard to tell the difference between? Um, so I guess like it's not between them, but when you see them on a paper, they usually do they always sort of look like that, or do you have to also like like? Well, I mean, so like, for example, limits to success, this limit here sometimes isn't there. Like limits to success will generally be a reinforcing feedback loop and a balancing feedback loop. There might be several variables across the reinforcing feedback loop. It won't just be two. There might be several variables across the balancing loop. It won't just be two. It may or may not have this limit. But the point here is that when you zoom out, you see that there is a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop. And then if you think that you can say, is this limits of success, then generally that you can say, well, if you start the system off in kind of the natural, whatever kind of initial state it is, it seems like initially the reinforcing loop that dominates, causing whatever variables are in this reinforcing loop to grow. And then over time, um, it kicks in the limits and that causes the balancing loop so um, this would be like the fish population example would fit into the limits of success, but you know a lot of those. So um, this is just a general kind of way to, to put your mind in the right spot. But um, but you know all of these little boxes that are here are less important than the loops. Really, it's how the loops are linked. Okay. So the and then like the same thing like drifting goals and escalation look very similar. They do. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, you know, the, the, the key difference here is that in drifting goals, the two balancing loops are moving a variable in the same direction. They kind of agree. So like in drifting goals, you might say the bottom loop is how much, um, the bottom loop is me. It's like how much I actually exercise might be the bottom loop down here, but the top loop might be how much I want to exercise. And in drifting goals, if you, um, the bottom loop is trying to move your actual exercise up to what you want. But the top loop is actually uh, psychologically moving your target down to what you're actually doing. So in drifting goals, you've got the target is coming closer to the performance as the performance is coming up to the target. In the end, things come to equilibrium uh, where you're um, you, you technically met your goal, but only because your goal has gotten less than it originally started. That's what drifting goals is. Escalation is when the two balancing loops are sort of moving in the opposite direction. So in escalation, it's like the United States wants to, so you know, it's in the news that Russia might be pulling out of uh, the, the nuclear uh, arms. Uh, non-proliferation, uh, uh, you know, treaty of uh, start or whatever. So, like, you know, so that's an example where, uh, you know, at one time the U.S. and the USSR, each one of them wanted to be the dominant, um, you know, nuclear uh, armed country. And so, whenever the U.S.S. or whatever the, the U.S.A. would go above the USSR, that would trigger the USSR to build more arms. And then that would trigger the USA to build more arms. And so you've now got a balancing loop where this one is trying to stay above this one, but then this one is also trying to stay above this one. And so whenever this balancing loop is successful at bringing itself up to be above the other one, it then generates a, a more of an imbalance to the other balancing loop. And then they kind of fight each other. And this goes on forever. So escalation sort of turns into a figure eight that effectively looks like a growth loop forever. Whereas drifting goals kind of actually um, reaches its goal even more quickly. Like here, the goal is never attained. Here it's attained more quickly because the goal actually drifts down to the target. 
And so that's the key there. They both have two balancing loops, but when the balancing loops work in the same direction, it's drifting goals. When they move in opposite directions, it's escalation. Yeah. Do we know what the corresponding behavior of time graphs looks like for each of these? Uh, I would say that um, a, a, a rough kind of cartoon qualitative feel, like, you know, so drifting goals, you can imagine that the goal is coming down, the performance is coming up, and then they come into equilibrium. Um, whereas in escalation, you can imagine the activity of one and the activity of the other are both growing. And so I think that, you know, for that knowing a rough general sketch of the behavior over time, especially for these simple ones, is good. Once things get into these multiple loops, um, I, I mean, I, I, it's, I'm probably not going to ask you about a behavior over time for tragedy of the commons. To me, the salient features of tragedy of the commons are that you've got this resource that um, individually, if you increase your uh, activity towards, you get more of the resource. But over time, as everybody does that, then everybody gets less of the resource. And so that, you know, so the behavior over time for tragedy and comments um, is, is less important to me because it's less fundamental. But <clears throat> the behavior over time of these simpler ones, that behavior over time seems like more fundamental. Like, you know, this this turns into a balancing loop, this turns into a growth loop. So I wouldn't hang up so much on the, the and also behavior of times like um, you know that's we do care about the dynamics of these things, but um, but a lot of that it, it is the, the these complicated behavior of times. That's really the role of another class like two twelve, where you build something like this. And then see what the behavior of time is. So that's why I'm thinking like maybe these top ones. Like you should know an S-shaped growth curve. That's when it's a success. Um, escalation, even though there's balancing loops, it probably produces growth. Um, that's probably a good one to know. Uh, but like shifting the burden, I'm not going to expect you to sort of be able to sketch out uh, behavior of time. I might maybe give you a behavior of time and then ask you to reason about it, but I'm not going to ask you to sort of pick. The behavior over time that is likely to be shifting the burden. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Are there going to be like any extended response questions? Um, I am not planning on doing any human graded questions. Anything? Um, and I, I want to make sure that I also don't move on from this. This question about the archetypes. So, any other questions about the archetypes, too? Yeah. Are we going to need to know how to create one from just like a certain topic or just like identify certain aspects or like identify what it is? Are we going to need to explain? Right. I would say be able to, um, I definitely could like show you a causal loop diagram with a missing variable and ask you which variable should go in there. I would definitely show you causal loop diagrams uh, with um, links unlabeled or loops unlabeled, or maybe links mislabeled, loops mislabeled. So being able to draw and read causal loop diagrams, I think is important. Being able to recognize um, endogenous, exogenous, and excluded variables, that's an important thing. It's like a fundamental concept of model building. So that would be in there as well. Questions related to that. Or any other questions? All right, so maybe what I'll do here, as you have questions, just interrupt me, raise your hand, or whatever. I'm just going to point out this kind of like a review of where we've been. So, like we started out, unit A, intro to systems thinking, and these are the things that I really wanted you to take out of that unit. So we started to you know, try to use these terms like system model variable uh, that we, you know, we'd be using throughout the rest of the semester. So those are important things to know. As I just mentioned, when we talk about variables in systems, they play different roles. You know, so knowing that you have an endogenous versus an exogenous variable, both of those are in the system, but one is determined by the system, the other is determined from outside. 
Um, there are variables that we have to exclude. Um, it's because it just would make our models too complicated. Um, and so, um, you know, that even though a system in real life has a lot more variables, the model of the system may not include everything. So I uh, think of the excluded variable. And then this idea, um, remember that I said you can endogenize a variable, so you can start with an exogenous variable and realize that whereas you assumed that it could be fixed over time, maybe actually you need to zoom out and think about how it's changing over time. And then your exogenous variable becomes endogenous. So you end up coming up with a way to say, you know, when um, these conditions change sufficiently you know, far enough, then I'm going to automatically have this previously fixed variable, exogenous slow variable, start changing with the rest of the system, what's referred to as endogenization. Um, leverage, so we talked about causal loop diagrams, help us to find leverage. So what does leverage mean to a systems thinker? This idea of how do I find an intervention that has the smallest amount of effort that has the biggest amount of action? Um, and then the feedbacks, you know, can I identify negative feedback? Um, you know, by counting negative links around a causal loop diagram, can I identify positive feedback? Not negative, it's positive. Um, and the synonyms, negative feedback can be called balancing or counteracting. Positive feedback has all sorts of names, including both vicious and virtuous cycle. So, um, you know, it sounds negative to say vicious uh, cycle, but a vicious cycle and a virtuous cycle mean the same thing, but one is sort of like a positive feedback that's leading to good outcomes and one's positive to good bad outcomes. Uh, being able to read these behavior over time plots, you know, a time on this axis and a variable on this one, that's uh, good to know. Um, you know, how to choose variables. Variables are noun phrases that are measurable or sortable, orderable. Um, being able to uh, draw causal links and, um, and label uh, feedback. So those are all the things hopefully coming out of you today you feel comfortable doing. Any questions coming out of you today? Well, if questions come up, I'm going to move on to you to be, but if they come up, just feel free and go backwards and forwards. I'm going to just, just reminding us what we've done so far this semester. So then you and me, we even popped out and started to say, right, that's the introduction to basic systems. What are some frameworks we can use to start thinking about systems a little more concretely? And we already talked about the systems archetypes, or otherwise known as traps. We call them traps because um, a lot of these um, end up being patterns that are easy to fall into. And when they're, you're in them, they can lead to sort of long-term problems, even though maybe in the short term, they seem to fix the problem. Um, we said we can use these archetypes in different ways um, that um, in that Kim and Lannan, they have these four ways. Um, I am, you're not going to leave this class in, in you know, and the, the term structural pattern templates. It's not like when you leave this class, there's going to be a lot of other people who know exactly what that means, because these are sort of invented by Kim and Lannan. But I do like these four categories because I do think they concretely grab the different ways that you can use it. So I might say in the midterm, um, you know, um, apply this lens to this system. Or um, you know, so I, I'm not interested in whether you know that the the strict definition of these things. But if I was to sort of say like they use this CLD as a dynamic theory for this. I want you to be able to, to understand what I mean by that from our experience with Kim and Landon. Um, the uh, archetype family tree, I talked about that a little bit. It's a great way to bring these archetypes together. Bounded rationality, that is a term used very widely throughout systems thinking. Know what bounded rationality is, this idea of making rational decisions based on an irrational model, a model whose boundary has been drawn too small, but it's excluded too many variables, down to rationality. Um, and then I gave some existence or some uh, examples of things like policy resistance being bound to rationality. I would just be familiar with some of those examples. I'm not going to, this isn't a class about memorizing case studies, so I'm not going to go back and say, 
what was the key problem um, in the um, you know in abortion controls in Romania in the 70s. Um, but you know, I, I if if you can understand the examples that we talked about there, you'll understand examples that I'll come up with for you to read about. Uh, in the any questions about the D? And just as a reminder, I put um, this little uh, in the notes that I've linked to this lecture on Canvas. Um, you can find this little quick reference. There's uh, additional quick references linked to, I think, whatever lecture it was that this was associated with Kim Atlanta. And there's also this archetypes family tree, which I think is really helpful in relating archetypes to each other. All right. So, any questions before we go into the resilience thing? Halfway through semester or the half semester. All right. So, then we started getting into uh, more complex frameworks, literally, uh, for thinking about systems, systems that exhibit other interesting properties besides just kind of the basic traps. And that was this idea of resilience. So, we introduced this term resilience, which kind of has to do with a, a system's ability to absorb uh, disturbances and, and not really change how it behaves. We talked about adaptability of uh, systems. Um, the, so there are adaptive systems, which actually do change internally. But then if we couple a resilient system with management, like from a human you know, source, then we can say how is that system able to be adaptive to maybe extend its resilience to make it more resilient so adaptability is how can we change a system to make it maintain as much function as possible beyond what it could on its own based on its normal resilience and then if we have to give up and say there's just no way to save this system can we transform it into another system that uh, can be useful to us in terms of sustainability. So those three terms, which we'll see again after the midterm, but I want to make sure you're familiar with them already. We talked about a complex adaptive system. So a complex system has emergence. Um, so the, it's more than the sum of its parts. Um, it's very difficult to predict um, how an individual component relates to the total function. And if that system is able to adapt, itself um, and reconfigure itself self-organized referring to the complex adaptive systems and and most systems in nature are complex adaptive systems a lot of systems like that aren't natural systems that are just sort of abiotic systems like hurricanes and things like that are not adaptive and we still view them as complex systems um, we talked about how these systems can have multiple stable states so you can have a system can be um it can be a, you know uh, I talked about my dog who has epilepsy. So he could be in a normal state or he could be in an epileptic state, you know, and he's temporarily in that epileptic state and he functions very differently and he goes back to a normal state. So that's an example of a system that can switch back and forth. And, um, and uh, so about adaptability, I actually just learned about um, a, for humans, there was actually a new intervention with humans where that's being experimented with, with epilepsy where it's like a pacemaker for the brain. And it can detect uh, the onset of a, you know, of a transition to that epileptic state. And then it can actually zap a portion of the brain to kick the, uh, the, the if you think of the ball and basin model, before the ball goes over the edge, it can kick it back towards the end of the basin and prevent the seizure from happening. So that's an example of an adaptable system because you add another little feedback loop and you take a system that had a, had a, a, a frailty, so it had a, a, a vulnerability, and you remove the vulnerability by, um, by adding this additional, or you extend the resilience regions so you can keep things in the desired stable state longer so that there's less likelihood that it'll transition to the adaptive or the alternative stable state. So, um, yeah, multiple stable states and stability regimes. We talked about initial conditions. So if a system starts in the wrong regime, it will go to that, um, that alternative stable state. And if you disturb it, it'll pop it over a threshold and it'll go into another stable state. And so all of that is hard to discuss without some mental model 
and we introduce the ball and basin model. So make sure you can look at one of these ball and basin models and know how it might relate. Like if I talk about a lake system, it can either be clear or murky, and it stays murky for a long period of time, or it stays clear for a long period of time. And you can transition, so it's like clear, but then if there's a large storm or whatever, it can then transition to be murky for a long period of time, then relate that with ball and basin model. Yeah. Can we maybe do an example where you like draw a ball and basin and like reinterpret it or something like that? Okay. Yeah, I think I think I could do something like that. Let's uh, let's try that. So let me throw out here. Um, okay. So I'm going to just draw sort of a, an arbitrary ball and basin model. Um, okay. So, um, all right, so here's a, a beginning sketch of a ball and basin model. So um, I could, um, you know, I've left out labels up here and down here. And so if I wanted to label, um, generically speaking, um, without getting into the specific system, what is a sort of generic label that I might put on an X axis for a ball and basin? What's being plotted on the x-axis of the ball of basin model? And as a hint, it's a type of variable. What type of variable gets plotted on this axis of the ball of basin? Yeah. Is it the exogenous variable? Um, well, remember the exogenous variable is, is uh, so I'll just write these reminders here. X is a slow. Um, you know, and you can, you know, nearly constant variable. So you, you just say ahead of time, my exogenous variable temperature is 50 degrees. For the rest of the system, you assume it's 50 degrees. So because this is trying to capture things that change over time, you probably don't um, want to plot the exogenous variable. Um, there is a structure where we put the exogenous variable on the x-axis. Does anybody remember what that is called? It's another diagram, but it puts the exogenous variable on the x-axis. Starts with a B. Bifurcation diagram. So, um, so I'll just make a note here that the bifurcation diagram, which we can get to, puts exogenous on x-axis or a horizontal axis. All right, so in that case, then what do we put on the x-axis of a ball and basin model? It's the thing that changes quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the regimes, um, the regime will be like a set of points. So we'll get into that. So, um, and I'd say, again, I would say that this is a type of variable. So I'll, I'll just, I'll begin there. So, Endogenous, right. So we're going to put the endogenous variable is on this axis. And so just as a reminder, this is fast. It changes um, over time with the system. All right, so in the water quality example, um, so that I just kind of gave there, can you give me an example of what an endogenous variable might be for that? Example, what would be something that might have two states? Yeah, was that okay? Um, the, the, the phosphorus, I would say that you know, it depends on where you're looking for the phosphorus. So, in the example from the book, they talked about phosphorus in the soil was an exogenous variable because it kind of was very slow. Uh, but the amount of phosphorus in the soil changed the way that the water above responded. Yeah, you say like water clarity. 
Water clarity, I would go, that, that's an easy one. There are other things we could do. They're like, the amount of phosphorus in the water, that could be an exotic experiment because that's changing over time very rapidly. But the phosphorus in the soil, that um, sort of changes more slowly. So that's why we have to think about like management solutions. Like what happens if, you know, do we need to uh, let the system settle down for the soil to kind of, you know, slow down? Or, but, but so something that would be easier for me to talk about here would be an example here would be like water clarity. And so if I'm looking at this diagram, um, where are the two alternative stable states for water clarity? I've got a bunch of other features drawn on here. So if you were to label the two alternative stable states, where would you label them? We don't know which one's which, but just in general, on this ball and basin model. Yeah. Oh, bottom of the dips. Bottom of the dips, that's right. Yeah, so I would say this one here, arbitrarily speaking, I'm going to call this a clear water. And I'll call this murky water. Murkier water. I'll say murky water. I'm going to make it strong. And so that would mean that if I'm, uh, if the system is sitting down here and you get um, a bunch of rain that stirs everything up, then that moves the system toward the murky water. And it's like moving up this hill. But when it moves up this hill, if it doesn't move that far and the rain stops, the natural processes, natural feedbacks in the system will gradually clear it out and it'll become clear again. Now, if you get a really, really bad rainstorm, it takes it over the threshold and then it might get stuck in this threshold. And that might happen like it's so murky for so long, it kills important, say, phytoplankton um, that uh, would, uh, would otherwise need sunlight that have some function. And if it's so murky for so long that those things that need light die and they don't come back, then um, if they somehow had a role to play in the clearing process of that water, then you could get stuck over here um, in the, mur the permanently murky water. And the only way to get the clear water back would be to totally change, like possibly introduce new organisms into the, the, the pond or the lake um, so that those new organisms can start restarting the process of demurkifying, you know, basically clearing this water out. And then once you get them back over this threshold, then the process takes over and you don't have to keep dumping the organisms back in. So murky water, clear water. And so I guess I could write, um, you know, this, you know, we could do this here would be disturbance. That can be Rejected. Whereas um, something like this would be a regime shift. All right, so with that in mind, what are, um, how would I define the regimes, the stability regimes in this diagram? What do they correspond to? Um, wait for somebody else. Yeah. So those are the those are the stable states associated. With it. So that, that so then pushing that a little farther is that what is the stability regime of murky water? How do I figure out like so murky water is the stable state, but the stable state has a curse as a set of initial conditions that if you start the lake in those conditions, they'll come back to that state. So how is the stability regime drawn on the ball and basin model? How is it depicted? How is it represented? What are the, or in other words, what are, how do I determine the group of points on this x-axis that 
represent states of the lake's water clarity that will come back to murkiness or come back to clarity. And the tipping points. Uh, well, that's so tipping point. That, that so tipping point will bring us back to this exogenous. Right now, uh, if we're talking about how do the, a tipping point is a, a a value of an exogenous variable which destroys a stability regime or introduces it. But if we if we assume our our, uh, our exogenous variables are staying constant. Um, how do we, how are the regimes, the stability regimes, remember this, we'll have to have how many stability regimes are in this diet? There are two stable states, so there are two regimes. And so the regimes are basically here and here. So if I want to highlight that, I can say that. Uh, this threshold is the point that separates these two stability regimes. So I've got this is the murky stability regime, and this is the clear stability regime. <clears throat> so I'll maybe write that here. So this down here is murky. <laughs> Stability regime. And this down here is clear stability regime. And the, what's being depicted here is if it's a clear water day and you get a storm, this stability regime shows you the buffer you have that that storm. Can, um, can upset the murkiness of the water uh, before it goes too far and the water can't recover itself. So the stability regime, one way to view it is if you could somehow start the lake uh, at time zero, um, if you started it in this position, it would go to clear water. In this position, it would go to clear water. All of these positions would go to clear water. Or another way to view it is if it was in the clear water state, if you got a disturbance that pushed it away, it would be guaranteed to come back so long as the disturbance stayed within the stability regime. If you move, disturb the lake and move it into another regime, then it will go to the stable state for that regime. So the stability regimes in the ball and basin model are like the valleys themselves. So the extent, like sort of like if you think about altitude, latitude, and longitude, the stability regimes are like the latitude and longitude that correspond to everything that is in the valley. And so we use the altitude as kind of to like draw a circle around certain latitudes and longitudes. In this case, there's only one of them. And so we say um, everything in this, in this ditch is this stability regime, and that corresponds to this stable state. Questions about that? Yeah. So when I said murky water and clear water, that's incorrect for labeling the stability regimes. I would say that um, that I view murky water and clear water as the kind of idealization of all the states in the stability regime. So the idea here is the water could be the water is definitely clear when it's right here, oh, but, but it's it right here. It's yeah, it's foggier. Um, so the idea is, as long as it doesn't get too foggy, it will become clear again. Okay. Yeah. So the proper label is clear stability regime. Yeah, the stability. Regime, yes, I would say that. Okay. Other questions? Questions about this? Does that help with what you were asking? Okay. All right. Now, maybe that's a good opportunity uh, because this was brought up as bifurcation diagram. Um, is that uh, a bifurcation diagram basically takes this picture and it stacks them on top of each other because every time you change an exogenous variable, you change the shape of this. 
So um, the exogenous variable example here um, might be, for example, soil phosphorus level. Because as they, and I'm not going to ask you about freshwater ecology. I'm not expecting you to be freshwater ecologists, phenologists, whatever. Um, but it's just a nice example that the book already brought up. And it talked about the mechanisms of which when there's a high level of phosphorus in the soil, it changes the processes that can happen in the water above that soil. So at, you have low phosphorus levels in the soil, maybe you get this, or maybe even you get um, if low wall phosphorus levels, you might even get just the clear water. But as the higher and higher phosphorus levels get up there, it starts creating this alternative stable state and making it deeper and possibly making the clear water shallower. And it's that idea that about um, at, at points of the soil phosphorus level where a stability regime disappears or appears, those are bifurcation points. And we can, we can show those points on a bifurcation diagram. So that was the example that, um, um, so that was the example where, now I summarize all the exogenous variables. So I can put an exogenous variable over here. This might be like soil phosphorus level. Phosphorus level. And on the y-axis, it's not this like potential field. On the y-axis, these are the kind of, well, just basically it's the stability regimes. Um, so stability regimes, or I should say alternative stable states, maybe it's just safer for me to write that but for confusion, I'll say alternative stable states. And so we might find that we've got, um, I'll move this over so I can write clear water. We might find that we've got clear water here. And we've got murky water down here. And um, maybe I'll, and I'm sorry, I just, because I'm making this up on the spot, I'm going to draw them on the other side so that it could correspond. At high levels of this, you know, I'll, I'll just say, like, maybe at very high levels of the exogenous variable, we only have murky water. So we'll have this, this line on your murky water. And at very low levels um, of the exogenous variable, we'll only have clear water. And at intermediate levels, we might have both. So maybe this goes like this. Maybe this goes like this. And um, I might have, and when there's both, you can't have two valleys without like a hill in between them. And so we would typically draw then the threshold in between them. And so um, here, so this is clear, water, murky, water. And so up until, I'll just maybe highlight, up until this point, this point where interesting things happen. So for all of these points down here, there's only clear water, only the clear water regime. Everything goes to clear water. So regardless of where you start or how big of a disturbance, it eventually clears out. Um, in the um, this state out here, this is only murky. So there's nothing you can do in the lake 
um, you're just stuck with the lake always being murky. But with these intermediate stage here, um, then it uh, depends um, on um, disturbance, I'll say. So what that means by that is if you're in this region, you go up to clear water. But if you're in this region, you go down to murky water. So for the same levels of the exogenous variable, depending on what the endogenous variable is, you either could end up with a clear lake or a murky lake. And so this bifurcation diagram is basically taking those ball and basin models, and it's like the ball and basin model is coming out of the page. And I'm like, I've got one basin here, that basin is getting shallower and shallower and shallower, a second basin shows up, I have two basins here, 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 here. Uh, but that first basin is now getting to a similar height as, as the new basin. Eventually, the first basin goes away entirely, and I'm stuck with the second basin. And that's what's being summarized in the bifurcation diagram. Questions about that? And then these two points. So what are these, uh, what are these points called? One name is bifurcation point, tipping point. A bifurcation point or a tipping point. And that term tipping, that's a term that systems theorists use to reflect a regime shift that's not due to a disturbance, like a simple disturbance. So like if it rains, um, it's possible you can get a large enough rain that you could flip from one regime to another, but the old regime still exists there. And so if you had another event that might somehow clear the lake out, it might flip back to the other one. Um, and so we don't refer to that as tipping. Now, if there's no rain events, but there's a farmer nearby and they're fertilizing and fertilizing and fertilizing, and then suddenly that affects the amount of phosphorus that's collecting in the soil. And then suddenly like overnight, the lake goes from clear to murky and there wasn't a rain. That's because you crossed a tipping point. You forced a regime shift by getting rid of one of the regimes. You know, so that the changing of the number of regimes uh, is a tipping point as opposed to just a regime shift where the number of regimes didn't change, but the system just moved over into the different regime. Any questions about that? Clear as mud? Yeah. So when, so the term threshold was used a lot during the quizzes. Yeah. When would that be used? Would that is that a just a synonym for those or is it for a different type of graph? Um, this here is what I call a threshold. Um I'll write it in here. This is okay, so on a ball and base model, you could use threshold. Yeah, and say, now, I mean, threshold is a general term. So in, in, in everyday language, you could say, uh, you know, the soil chemistry, like even though soil phosphorus levels are endogenous, I guess I could say soil phosphorus level reached a threshold, and that threshold was a tipping point. So I suppose based on context, we can use the term threshold, but at least in the terms of ball and basin models and all that, we think of thresholds as the barriers between regimes and tipping points as the points at which regimes disappear or reappear. And the term tipping comes from thinking about a wine glass where um, the threshold is the rim of the glass. If you put enough wine in it, it'll go over the threshold and spill. But if you didn't change the amount of wine in the glass, but you tilted the wine glass enough that it falls over and all the wine spills out, then the wine has spilled out, not because you've changed the amount of wine in the glass, but because you changed the structure of the system. And that's a tipping point. Yeah. Um, this is a completely unrelated question to this. Um, I've just I wasn't here last Thursday and I was looking through the notes and I'm kind of confused on the low entropy and high entropy as it is used the Shannon entropy concept because like I see where the low entropy has low diversity and high entropy has high diversity which I understand like understanding that entropy is related to randomness I just don't understand the like 
related charts because the one that's like looking all orderly and in the same row is high diversity, but the one that is like sporadic is low diversity. So you would think that like, I don't know, could you just go into that? Well, so I don't know. So when you say the charts, but you mean like um, it, when you say, uh, so you mean like where I showed like, like molecules kind of spread out versus molecules that are clumped together? Is that what you mean by? Um, on the notes, there were like graphs with, um, Oh yeah, okay, that right. So you're referring to um, distributions like wealth distribution, for example. So, um, so in the example that I gave there, and I think it is a good idea to, to be able to think about uh, distributions of things as macro states. And so I was saying that we think about wealth, then the idea there was if you think about how much money each person has. There are, um, you know, two different. There are several different ways we can think about money per person. And so, if everybody has the same amount of money, um, so this is um, everyone has exactly the same bank account balance versus. Um, here, where we can think about these are different balances, we can say some are rich, um, some are poor. Oh, I see. So there is. Yeah, and then some in between. Right. And so we would refer to this as um, this is a low entropy distribution. For and this is high entropy, and it it and. It's, it turns out it's, it's for two reasons. Um, for one, we refer to this as a low entropy distribution because there's only one way you could ever get this distribution. And so there's no way, like, if you and I have this, if we all have the same bank account balance and we swap our bank accounts, it doesn't change anything. I um, wouldn't even notice that that happened. So there's only one micro state, there's only one way to distribute money. But if we're over here, um, you could be rich and I could be poor, and that would fit this. Or you and I could switch our bank accounts. Now I could be rich, you could be poor. That would still fit this. So where there's only one microstate that this would work, there are two different microstates, me rich, you rich, that both fit within here. So this has a higher number of microstates. Um, and that's one reason we say it's high entropy. Um, but it's also high entropy because if we think in terms of Shannon entropy or information or whatever, there's more surprise here. So um, I can ask each one of you, I'm not going to, how much money you have in your bank accounts. Here, there's no surprise. Um, I know that we all have $100 in the bank account. So when I ask you, there's no information. Here, so there's no low surprise. Here, there's high surprise because I don't know, you could be rich, you could be poor. And I ask you, and the instant you tell me, I'm surprised. No, 25 to 25 million. So um, high entropy corresponds to high surprise, but it also corresponds <laughs> to high numbers of microstates. Um, we, what's there another? Yeah, no, that was, I was going to ask that. Um, are there, will we be able to calculate any logarithmic functions? No, I'm not going to ask you. Um, I want you, I, I want you to know that entropy is written in terms of a logarithm, but I'm not going to ask you, I might ask you to count up the number of microstates, maybe, um, but I'm not going to say calculate the number of bits of Shannon entropy um, in this, because it's that's just kind of like plug and chug, and it, it's kind of the piece. There's no value to that to me, but I do think it's good for you to know that there is a logarithm in the equation, and the only reason the logarithm is there is to make multiplicities additive. Because that's really what logs do, is they turn A times B into log A plus log B. And that allows us to break systems up according to entropy. Anything else? Yeah. Um, or 115. All right, so, um, so, two, so for today then, um, the, the review quiz will be available today and tomorrow. 
You can email me questions today and tomorrow. If you email me questions after the exam period is open, I'll be a little cagey. You can ask me like a few things, but there'll be some things that I probably won't be able to answer because I won't know if you started the midterm or if you talked to somebody who started the midterm and so on. Um, so um, if you have any questions, try to get them to me today or tomorrow, and I'll try to be as helpful as I can be. Um, and I guess that's about it. I'll give everybody attendance credit for today. And um, if you have any other questions, feel free to come back. Thank you.